episode 70 of the Real World Wellness Podcast. Happy New Year, everyone. This is Christine Lehman. I'm a nutritional therapist and the Reverse Diabetes Coach, which is also the name of my website. I am delighted to share this first episode of the New Year with you and to remind you that I am accepting a limited number of clients in January, so you can reach out to me at Christine at ReverseDiabetesCoach.com. My first name is spelled C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E. Or you can use the contact form on my website. Please remember while you're listening to the show, advice and information we provide is intended to be helpful and informative, but is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment. So I'm delighted to welcome integrative veterinarian Dr. Julie Meyer on the podcast today. And Julie... Dr. Julie combines conventional and complementary treatment modalities, providing the ultimate integrative healing experience for pets. She has dedicated most of her career to holistic medicine and rehabilitation, and is an adjunct clinical assistant professor for the Midwestern University College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Meyer is certified in veterinary acupuncture, veterinary chiropractic, canine rehabilitation, is a Reiki practitioner, and continuously seeks education in the growing field of integrative care and physical rehab. She is a member of several associations, including the American Holistic Veterinarian Medical Association, the International Veterinary Acupuncture Society, and the American Academy of Veterinary Acupuncture. Dr. Julie owned two rehab and holistic centers in Illinois and was named one of Chicago's best vets by Chicago Magazine and received the 2010, and help me with this, uh, is it Lambs Yukonaba? Yukonaba, it's um, it's a pet food, and they sponsored um, a Rehab Excellence Service Award. Wonderful. So uh, Dr. Julie received that in the field of veterinary rehabilitation in 2010, and she has appeared on numerous network news programs, radio shows, hosted webinars, published articles, and co-authored a book, and I was going to ask you the name of that as well. Great. So it's the um, Country vet- Veterinarian um, Holistic Healing for Cats and Dogs. Oh, wonderful. I may want to get that myself. And, <laughs> and she also serves as a guest lecturer at Veterinary Continuing Education Seminars and Rehabilitation and Complementary Veterinary Medicine. She also has a radio show called Holistic animal care radio show and Julie's going to share a little more information about that at the end of the show but let me ask you quickly is that a call-in show yes um, it will be structured where um, people can if they're not shy they can call in Um, if they are shy and they want to get their questions approached um, they can do it via Facebook Twitter uh, the website, things like that. So mm-hmm. those will be available off of the network, which is um, Voice America. Okay, so is this something new for you? Indeed. I, I've been on the radio and I've hosted some shows in the past, but this will, this is a show that I have created, and so I am the, the primary host and designed the mm-hmm. entire layout. Wonderful. Well, it's always start, exciting to start a new venture like that. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what led to your interest in veterinary medicine. So I know uh, we're going way back (laughs) because I've been in the field since 1991 when I graduated vet school, but I I knew as a child that um, I wanted to be a veterinarian. So um, actually probably since I can first pronounce it, not spell it, but pronounce it, (laughs) and um, You know, I always just had an interest. I would bring home home strays and things like that. So growing up as a child, I definitely had pets and um, loved to take care of them. And then um, getting more serious as I, you know, go through elementary school and then high school, I really knew that this is what I, this is what I needed to do. So um, I had, you know, you learn that you have to have a real good GPA to get into med school. So... Um, I studied hard, and then I went to undergrad, and then I was luckily accepted at University of Illinois, and that's where I'm from, and that's where I pursued my um, schooling, and um, I graduated honors from vet school. Oh, that's great. And what was the name of the vet school? University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Okay, wonderful. 
So, um, and that's, a, I guess that points out too that um, the DVM is the, is that a, sort of the norm for veterinarians to have a DVM? Yeah, so it's called Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, or it could be like VMD, which is Veterinary Medical Doctor. Okay. So I know the category of pets is broad, and I was wondering if you tend to focus mainly on cats and dogs. So uh, actually, I um, in, in initially when I was a young veterinarian, I focused on exotic pets as well as uh, dogs and cats. Um, now my focus is small animals. I'll still see exotics because I've done acupuncture on birds, um, hedgehogs, things like that. So I will see small animals. But I also have some equine training. So when we go through acupuncture school or chiropractic school for vets, um, you learn on dogs, cats, and horses. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm able to take care of, um, you know, small animals, pocket pets, to uh, what I tell my clients is whatever can walk through the door. <laughs> well, that gets interesting with horses. So. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I will actually see them outside. Um, we have a facility where, you know, people trailer the, their pets and their horses, and I had an alpaca come into the office that, um, it was a baby, so it was able to fit through the front door. Um, so I will, uh, since I am trained in other species, I definitely, um, yeah, uh, I'll see literally whatever, <laughs> whatever comes my way. Well, that's great. Do you ever do house calls? I used to, um, but uh, Arizona is pretty spread out. Mm -hmm. So when you're going barn to barn, um, you're limited to how many patients you can see, which, yeah. is, which is not good. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am stationary at the moment. I work with an orthopedic surgeon. I'm in his um, clinic. So I do a lot of uh, rehabilitation and pain management with holistic care. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you brought up holistic care because I was wondering if you could give us a little primer on what integrative veterinarian medicine is. And I love the word. Um, integrative just meaning kind of a marriage of allopathic and non-traditional. So, and that's what I do. So I have the medical science background and then I have the holistic background. And, and, and I love that um, because I'll tell my clients that I'm holistic, I'm not ballistic. So if you're hit by a car, we may give you a steroid shot. But mm -hmm. the follow-up or long-term will be, you know, how can we manage your discomfort? How can we manage um, healing of bones all holistically? So um, my skills are acupuncture, chiropractic, I'm certified in. I know a lot about homeopathic medicine, mm -hmm. herbal medicine, Chinese herbs. And so I tend to focus my treatments and my modalities on a more um, holistic approach. I'm also a Reiki practitioner. So I want to be able to offer my patients a lot of different modalities in the holistic integrative care. So I'll work with veterinarians. I'll try to get them off the medications while I integrate, you know, a, a different kind of a healing, which would be the herbs and homeopathic remedies and aromatherapy and things like that. So. So my goal is to try to get these patients off of um, allopathic meds mm -hmm. and modalities and try to transition them 100% to holistic if I can. Sometimes I can't, but that means we're in a better spot because then they're on less of a dose of pharmaceutical. Right. So would you say that is one of the main uh, differences uh, between what you and a traditional veterinarian would be doing? Huge, huge. The, the traditional vet will, and that's what I graduated being, um, you know, your uh, toolkit, if you will, will consist of surgeries and definitely heavy on the pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. So I am, I'm with that, I understand that medicine, and I know that that works, but long term, that's where we get in a lot of trouble. So I try to get these patients off of the medications or at least at a lesser dose while incorporating even, you know, even food therapy. So right. um, I, I just use a lot of different modalities and then this way, because not everybody will resp respond to acupuncture, mm -hmm. not every patient will respond to chiropractic. Mm -hmm. so I like to have a bunch of tools in my toolbox 
And if I do need to prescribe a painkiller, I'll prescribe a painkiller. So that's, I like these options. And obviously, though, the holistic approach is my ultimate goal. Right. And the other sort of thrust of this would be prevention. Do you get some, some pets, you know, some pet owners just coming to you straight off the bat, you know, with a more prevention mindset or a long-term mindset? Yeah, totally. It's awesome because I, I have a lot of clients that come to me and they just got a new puppy and I'm like, perfect. Congratulations, you have made the right move because we're going to start you from scratch. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to show you what kind of diets are appropriate for your breed and for what you want to do with your pet. What is the vaccine protocol? What's the latest? Because you're not going to get that from your veterinarian. Mm -hmm. Your your Mm -hmm. traditional veterinarian, let's put it that way. So I like to I like to see people come in when they do. You know, they just uh, adopted a pet or they, you know, just bought a puppy from a breeder, and then this is where we can start from the ground up to be proactive and to be preventative so that we don't see a lot of cancer or arthritis and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. And, I, you know, I think holistic approaches are particularly good for chronic conditions. Indeed, definitely. Mm-hmm. And, and to be very proactive. How can we avoid, you know, what we do see in modern times in veterinary medicine? Right, and I would think, you know, you probably heard me saying I specialize in type 2 diabetes because it's really totally, it's totally preventable, first of all, with with lifestyle, right, right? diet and nutrition and uh, exercise, but it's also reversible, um, and I've had good success with this whole, what I call the three or prong approach, so I would think, I was wondering if you get the same, you know, is diabetes one of the conditions that you, type 2? that you see in cats, because I, I know obesity is an issue among pets. Yeah, I was going to say, definitely in cats, I see a big turnaround, um, because they're eating this, you know, carbohydrate-dense uh, kibble, okay? Mm-hmm. So first of all, it dehydrates them, and then obviously it's the wrong approach to their care, because cats are, are obligate carnivores, so they need a high-protein diet. So when they're growing up with these, um, like I said, high carb diet, it it just alters the whole endocrine system, and it's really sad. Mm-hmm. And do you find, um, just to kind of expand a little bit on diet, um, a- as I mentioned earlier, I do have two cats, so you're probably gonna have a few cat questions here. But but dogs, do they uh, have different dietary needs than cats? Indeed. And it's, it, and it's huge. So dogs, they, they don't need as much protein as cats. So cats should have about 95% protein because, again, they are obligate carnivores. Dogs can adapt, kind of like the coyotes um, and the wolves. So if, if they don't have rabbits or mammals, you know, running around that they can catch and, and eat, then they can actually eat uh, plant material. So they're just like us. We, you know, we have those kind of choices and opportunities, and the dog gut is is very similar. Um, but again, the cats, on the other hand, totally different story. So they need the mice, they need the rabbits, they they definitely need that meat, and they need the bone, you know, kind of the, a good meat to bone ratio. So carbohydrates, not a big part of their diet. Mm-hmm. What do you say to those vets who are kind of insisting that, um, for example, Hill's Prescription Cat Food. um, Right. There's one that is, you know, blander, but it has a lot of vitamins and minerals in there. Um, But it is, they also throw in rice. So do you agree with that, or do they not need rice? Of course not, no. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, What's what's interesting is Hill's, Purina, um, you know, these, these big pet food companies, and they do sell prescription diets. Um, the, the research is amazing. I, I, you know, especially in school, we had to read their books and things like that. But the research is amazing. I've even seen um, in some of the Hills um, nutrition books that they did some research, for example, on ginger and cancer and ginger as an anti-inflammatory. And, and what's interesting to me is they actually you know, spend a lot of money um, doing their own research and, and their scientific studies, 
and I don't see it incorporated in their diet. So mm-hmm. as, 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 a, as a business, all right, they, you know, as a company, they do great research, but as a business, they're not putting these things in their products. And it's really interesting that you see that they're looking at this, but, but maybe it's not lucrative, you know, they're, they're a big industry. Um, so that's kind of surprised me. Um, so I do like their research. I do like what they are discovering about food ingredients and things like that. But I don't see them practicing it. So yeah. it's confusing to me. And, you know, again, in vet school, we grew up with that's what you do is you just prescribe these products. If you have diabetes, you give them, you know, X. If you have heart disease, you give them X. But that's kind of brainwashing. Um, And unfortunately, this is still existing to this day in veterinary schools. As as you mentioned, I am an adjunct professor at Midwestern University, the first vet school to open up in Arizona. And it's amazing. It is still amazing to me that nutrition is so not focused heavily in Mm. these schools. Yes, yes. And... um this is a good point, I think, for me to just share very briefly that um, my encounter with a, a new vet, but part of a practice that I've been going to, and um, she did switch to this Hills prescription cat food with chicken. Um, I was doing just a straight tuna with Trader Joe's. And my cat was vomiting, not chronically, but like once a day for two days. So I decided to take her in. And we switched to that. And what concerned me more, though, was she wanted to order a ton of blood work right off the bat because she thought that, and I agree to some extent, my cat had lost four pounds in almost two years. But that... But she needed to lose weight. She was 15 pounds, and she needed to lose actually four pounds. So she was, and I've been using Hill's uh, diet food for like a year and a half. And so um, she jumped to the blood, wanting to do a very expensive blood workup. And I had to kind of persuade her to slow down a little bit and do like a stool test. All her vitals were normal, so we did a thorough exam. Then. It just seemed to me like the next step would be to do the stool test, to rule out parasites, and then maybe, if needed, jump to an antibiotic. But so I, we, I ended up taking her home with the, the new prescription cat food, and then she had diarrhea for a few days. Um, But I had left with a prescription for an anti-vomiting pill, which she, the vet absolutely insisted I give her, and I didn't feel that that might be necessary, so I didn't. And her vomiting resolved like the day I took her, you know, we went back home. I mean, it was just an outpatient visit. So I didn't need to do that. Then um, because of the diarrhea, it lasted two days. And it wasn't, again, chronic. It was like once or twice a day. Um, She wanted to prescribe an antibiotic. And I, again, wanted to give it a little bit more time. And my instincts were right. It just cleared up on its own. Right. So, you know, whether this is the perfect diet, you know, the perfect cat food or not remains a bit debatable, but it was enough just to, and, and who knows, the body, as we know, is very resilient. And it just, that little change in her diet, plus I think being on the bland food probably did help. Um, and time resolved the whole thing without any medication. So it really raised that issue of our traditional vets, you know, over-prescribing, and it sounds like that's how they're trained, and it, that is their toolbox, just like human doctors. Right. And that they're not willing, in my opinion, this was a, it turned out to be a fairly minor thing, and it just would resolve, it just resolved on it, really, with that, that little change and time. Mm-hmm. Which was good. Right, absolutely, absolutely. But frankly, you know, too, I mean, I'm not rich, and I'm sure a lot of people aren't either. And, you know, I could have faced over a $500 vet bill if I hadn't pushed back a little bit. Right. And, and, and you're right. That's, you know, that's their ammo. Um, and 
they're going to suggest, of course, diagnostics um, because it's almost negligence if they don't. So they also have to just approach you with these options. And, you know, this is where um, there are sometimes scare tactics. There are sometimes that authoritative, you know, white coat syndrome, as we call it, Mm -hmm. that some people wouldn't question what their doctors tell them, okay, and these options. And, and what's really sad is, as far as options are concerned, you know, this is where the general medicine practitioner, veterinary medicine practitioner, needs to also offer these alternative therapies, okay? So, especially, you know, it, 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 I'm, I don't expect them to say, hey, your, your cat is vomiting and, and take these foods or go see a holistic vet. I'm not talking about that, but when there's chronic things, and especially musculoskeletal situations, and they don't know what's going on, and they just dispense, you know, an anti-inflammatory and a painkiller, and and, and that pet keeps coming back for refills, and the lymph never goes away. This is where I I hope in the future, this is you know, this is going to be our future in veterinary medicine would be that now let's say. Guess what? CP is not getting any better. This is all I can do for you. These are my skills. Now I think you need to go to get some rehab. So I'm hoping that that day will come where the veterinarians will be more open to alternative approaches and will offer that to their clients. And that's why I'm designing that radio show is because I want people to be aware that there are there's other things out there. There's other approaches. There are other modalities healing healing properties so so that's where veterinary medicine i think is lacking but that's why i wanted to get involved with this um with the vet school Mm -hmm. because i want the students to be able to approach their their patients and clients and say listen i did everything i could do with the skills that i have learned now i think you need to go see blah blah so i would really really like to see that door open where now alternative medicine, holistic medicine, rehabilitation can be an option. Yeah, and I guess, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, even starting with, um, I would prefer in all honesty to start with someone like you because I have a feeling that you would not necessarily have gone the medication route. Right, absolutely. And what would you, Absolutely. would you have done herbs or would you have just done what I did, which is to kind of see if the diet works? Yes, I mean, you want to fast if you can um, to just kind of, you know, let the gut relax, um, let let the stomach relax. Um, but I'll use, uh, and definitely use herbs, I'll use homeopathic medicine, Nux Vomica, awesome, have that in my toolbox. Um, I'll also say, let's do this kind of a diet, let's. Let's do a little sweet potato to add with the chicken or a bland meat, and we're going to feed that. See what the you know, see what we get out of the gut, see what we get out of the stomach. Um, so I'll just be obviously I'm not going to throw medication, especially not without a complete diagnosis. Um, but I'm going to try number one is start with the diet. And if the diet's not going to help, then Nux Vomica has been an awesome go-to for me for, um, you know, just an undiagnosed vomit, diarrhea, or upper or lower GI issue. And I'm sorry, do you mind spelling that for me? I could... N-U-X, and then the it's a genus species, and then Vomica. And that's designed to treat uh, vomit, or...? Uh, actually, vomit, diarrhea, and constipation. So it's mm. kind of a good all around. But that's mm-hmm. that's been excellent. Mm. Um, and even in cats, mm-hmm. cats respond pretty well to homeopathic remedies. Mm-hmm. And that you can buy at most of your local um, health food stores, mm-hmm. the grocery stores. Mm-hmm. Uh, is really common. Very very common. Now, one thing I know with the um, the pills that I was given, which <laughs> didn't end up using, but I had to cut them into teeny little pieces. So it kind of ah. raises the issue of dosing because you're using technically adult, um, in this case, herbs, right? You know, they're for, designed for humans. So do you have to uh, do... Yes, correct. They are designed for humans, but they do come in liquid as well. 
Okay, and then how would you adapt that though to your animal? I mean, you wouldn't necessarily give them the same amount if it's their instructions on it for humans. Right, and, and that's where, um, you know, I come into the picture and I say, okay, you know, A, how serious is the condition? Then I'm going to go and give you a frequency. And then I'm going, and there's different um, uh, potencies of these remedies. So depending on how serious it is, I'm going to give you the potency to get. And then exactly, then um, I basically extrapolate down from a, usually a children's dose and I'll extrapolate down to the weight. So, um, and, and what's awesome, what I love about homeopathic remedies is really they can take that whole bottle and they can't OD on it. Hmm. So the side effects are minimal. If the remedy really doesn't work for them and it kind of just goes over their head, so to speak. Um, so it's, it's gentle, it's safe, you can use it chronically. Um, you know, with guidance and with advice. And so that's what I, that's why I go to the homeopathic remedies and they work pretty quickly. Sometimes the herbs don't work immediate, mm -hmm. um, but the homeopathics tend to work very fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're designed to mimic the uh, body's response, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now this is very fascinating. Have you found other herbs like, um, I believe you studied herbs, right? Right. And um, so you studied them in pets. If there are other ones that you have found to be particularly useful in dealing with common conditions, um, I guess that's, yeah, definitely yeah. That's a, that's a that's a broad spectrum, yes. Yeah. And then that would be you know depending on what we what body systems or ailments we are dealing with, what mm -hmm. herbs would be appropriate mm -hmm. or blends of herbs. Mm -hmm. um, and I tend to use different companies that I like that I'm familiar with that the products have worked in the past mm -hmm. um, and you know that offer kind of an array of different uh, Chinese herbs um, Western herbs as we call them as well um, so sometimes I flip flop between the two different philosophies and the, and the different kinds of herbs so there's lots of options with herbs and, it, and if we try something and we're not seeing anything you know any any results then again we'll mix up the formulas and let's see what the next approach would be sometimes you're, pe you're um, peeling an onion so to speak so you know especially in Chinese medicine everything has like a core reason for the symptoms that you're seeing and sometimes you're kind of peeling away at that onion and you're getting through all these symptoms and then you finally get to the core which means if you can change the core then meaning the core cause then this is where the preventative comes in you try to keep that core cause under control so you don't see these external symptoms so it's, it's fun it's 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 their own science, definitely. Um, there's tons of research. There's so, tons of scientific papers out there. So this isn't just you know making things up and and looking at just you know traditions being passed down. Nowadays, we even have the evidence behind it, and that's what I like evidence-based medicine because that's what I grew up with, so to speak. In vet school, everything has to be proved, mm -hmm. you know, via a, a research paper. So. Right. I'm, I'm really liking um, on the chat groups that I have of the associations that I belong to, the, the research is there. And so in my scientific brain, I get to see the evidence and that's fabulous. And that's particularly applied to pets, the evidence. Oh yeah, so, so the evidence will be, you know, what, what's happening in the human world as well. So we get um, human research papers, but definitely then extrapolating and how they're using it in the pets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the doses, the effectiveness of them, any side effects, toxicities, just like they would with people. So it's, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I um, regularly track uh, the National Institute for Integrative Health. They used to be Alternative and Complementary Medicine. Um, and they, because NIH, which is here in my area, the National Institute right. of Health, is known, you know, that's sort of the gold standard for what the kinds of research they do. So I'm glad at least they have this, it's actually a center devoted to integrative health, um, and they do look at herbs. I would like to see them broaden that a bit to do more nutrition, not just, you know, supplements. 
um, but they are at least doing you know some some good research and getting it out there. Um, the other thing I was wondering about um, you mentioned acupuncture as a modality that you use, and I just interviewed a, a holistic acupuncturist on the show, and we talked about moxa bustion, so you know which combines sort of mugwort with uh, into a preparation and uh, used with acupuncture needles. So I was just curious if you had done that with pads. Absolutely. We, um, I love moxibustion. Um, in, uh, I'm, I'm housed in Arizona. We don't have a lot of winter, but uh, it, moxibustion is great for arthritis, and, and especially in the winter because it's cold and arthritis, and the point, you know, they get stiff. But moxibustion is awesome. Like you said, it is mugwort. Um, what's what's what we have though we have fur so <laughs> you know when, when you have flames or um you know these devices uh, they're kind of like punks you know how you light a punk and it keeps going mm -hmm. uh, or incense things like that um the fur is there the fur can get away get, get in the way um of of close mock combustion yeah eating trying to trying to target the joints. Right. Um, so we have what's called, it's called a tiger warmer, and literally the moxa is very thin. It's about maybe as big as a small straw, and there's a device that holds it, and we're able then to, um, you know, move the moxa motion over the target tissue. Oh, yeah. So we, yeah. yeah, so we definitely use it in, in our field as well. Mm-hmm. So since you specialize in sort of musculoskeletal issues, which makes sense since you're uh, focusing on rehabilitation, what are some of the common ones that you deal with? Lots of arthritis. That's mm -hmm. probably number one. Mm -hmm. um, geriatric dogs, um, they're on buckets of medication, buckets of you know anti-inflammatories, um, painkillers. Some of them will be on different kind of painkillers. You, you, you know, you can't, you have to do things with the joints. You can't just medicate them. So, um, and, or these dogs, they can't tolerate the, the meds. They get diarrhea. They're sick from the meds. Mm -hmm. Their liver is shot. Their kidneys are shot. So, what we do is, is awesome, is amazing. We do a lot of physical medicine. I have an underwater treadmill. We have um, low, la low laser light therapy. So, it's low level, um, meaning it, it's, you know, it's not hot, it's not um, burning, it's, it's not too traumatic to the tissues. Um, we, teach, we teach pets to work on physio balls, to work on those yoga balls and things like that. We get the patient moving. We can treat, again, target these tissues even with herbs, topicals, orals. It's fantastic. And, and I get a lot of you know, thank yous from the clients. They're like, thank you for, for getting my dog back. My dog is like a puppy again. You know, oh. my dog is, is now going for walks, is interactive with the family. The quality of life is what we really try to focus on. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that with this medication. And again, that's where the toolboxes are different. Mm -hmm. So um, I know you also practice chiropractic um, veterinary medicine. And so I was wondering how... Can you give us a few examples of how you would use uh, chiropractic techniques? I use chiropractic for just about anything, and that's how the, the acupuncture is as well. Um, most of my patients will get um, a blend of these modalities. Um, I'll use it prophylactically, so mm -hmm. I have lots of sports um, athlete patients out there. Um, agility is huge here, dock diving is huge, fly ball is huge. So. Everybody's very active with their pets, mm -hmm. and they're very competitive. So I like I have them come in once a month during their high season, and I just do adjustments to be proactive. Um, I'll treat injuries with chiropractic. I'll treat just arthritis, just geriatric ailments with uh, chiropractic. So um, I love it. It's been an awesome tool. Literally. You know, have pets limping coming in, and they're walking when they're when they're leaving. And I, you know, I get chiropractic myself, so I understand. You know, also on the receiving end, um, how it does benefit the body. So it's it's been a great, great, fantastic tool. 
Do you use that technique called, it's ART? So, so ours is uh, kind of the traditional um, uh, chiropractic approach. So we don't use, we don't use any devices, uh, meaning we don't use any activators or any kind of tools. We use our hands mm -hmm. and we are doing um, thrusts um, to the actual joint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I active release technique. I thought it was more pressure, but I'm I'm not familiar with all the details. Um, and there's yeah, there's joint mobilizations mm -hmm. and things like that that you can, you know, just do joint compressions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great because again, that's targeting the you know the if you have a diagnosis and you know it is that joint area um, that's very kind and gentle, so it's not a lot of thrust, but it's more of um, oscillations and things, so, mm -hmm. so that's very great for pain, mm -hmm. um, very great for getting the joints mobile, mm -hmm. so, uh, and that's based on a, the physical therapist side, so they have taught us a lot of different maneuvers that they do on humans, and we can apply the same thing, because a joint is a joint. Absolutely. Muscle muscle. Right. They may, you know, they may look different and have different functions, but basically they're, they're the same kind of tissue. Right, so um, you mentioned athletic animals, uh, dogs, and I, I, do you want to just um, maybe explain a little bit what that means, what, you know, these, I, I'm not familiar with the particular sports that they're, the dogs are playing with their owners, is that correct? Right, so there's, there's a lot of different um, canine sports out there now, um, and actually it has transferred to other species. Um, so agility is probably number one. Um, it's it's everywhere. It's in every state. Agility means that the the owner and the pets are going through a course of obstacles. Ah, okay? okay. So so they have jumps. They have what's called an A frame, and you can just imagine it's it's boards shaped in an A. They have to climb over that. They have a dog walk, which is a narrow plank that they have to walk up and over. And really, they're running on these pieces of equipment. There's tunnels that they have to go through, so there's different kinds of obstacles, and it's based on speed, accuracy, because you don't want to knock the bar or, you know, miss, like, go around an obstacle. So there's this whole pattern that they have to follow, and then they're timed. So very highly competitive. Um, these dogs, you know, are trained uh, constantly. They're, they're weekend warriors. They have three-day shows. They may do six runs a day. These runs, though, only last probably less than 30 seconds. So okay. they're very quick. Yeah. High ball, what that is, it's a relay race. They have to go, um, it's a team, and it's a tag team, and the dogs have to go over a series of jumps. They have to hit a box that has a springboard and then a ball comes out, they have to grab that ball and run back with it, and then the next one goes, and the next one goes, and the next one goes. So that's really fun, but I see a lot of sports-related injuries, just yeah, like was, you would in football, right? right? Just like yeah. you would in basketball. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's lots, there's frisbee competitions, there's dock diving, where they have to you know, chase something in the water, and how far can you jump out, so it's awesome it is huge in in the pet world it is and even herding you can even just have herding competitions where you're herding stock of animals of cattle sheep and even ducks <laughs> awesome yeah it's awesome so and, and what's cool is a lot of them were using their instincts what they were originated for the different breeds mm -hmm. and and that comes out and we're able to you know have them express themselves doing their job it's awesome Right. So now, of course, I have to speak up about cats. But <laughs> <laughs> they do have cat agility. They have rabbit agility. They have chicken agility. So, yeah, you can even get the cats involved. And that would be lovely because uh, even though my cats are sisters, they're completely different in terms of uh, their interests and their um, metabolism and uh, just how they're built. So one is very athletic. And she loves to run. I mean, we actually go for walks um, wow. where she will just run across the field. And I am like, good, expend that energy because she doesn't do well inside, um, even though she's, she's calming down a little bit. Whereas her sister, the one who is overweight, um, is, is much more, I guess, a stereotypical cat 
where she likes to just sleep and hang around and my challenge with her is to get her to exercise and she has no interest in balls most of the time and so on so I don't know what would you recommend for a cat like that who's indoors who's just and and she's 13 now um, right so um, and I, I know this kind of involves food but what I've done um, especially if you have stairs you know I've had clients like throw a piece of kibble or you know throw a ball or something that strikes their fancy they have to run down the stairs and they have to come back up mm -hmm. um, I'll hide things so that they have to search the house so instead of just you know dumping all of their food if it's kibble you know because you can't keep a lot of wet food out <laughs> but you know then you place it in different rooms and they have to scavenge and they have to go find it which is their hunting and things come out mm. um, laser light I think is awesome yes yeah, cats so are into that and you can have them climb the walls with that you could have them run around because they get the again that hunting chasing prey and thing uh, comes out mm -hmm. so I have a blast with that because my dogs and cats you know, they all charge it, so they have a good time with that. Um, but if you hide things, you know, uh, because if they would have to hunt. They would have to go seek, uh, go to different spots and smell so they could use their olfactory senses. Um, it's just different things. Even sometimes the catnip. Mm -hmm. You know, they're rolling around in the catnip, then you could throw the catnip uh, toy somewhere and have them go find it. And yeah, that's a kind of, you know stimulate those uh, sensory uh, areas too, their eyes, their their nose for sure. Mm -hmm. Now that's, that's, a, that's a good idea because they like their scratch pad, which I sprinkle catnip on, and they will get a little bit of a, you know, short workout, but the idea of throwing the catnip, I know they're those little toys that you can throw around. Mm -hmm. So, and you're right, they like the laser light. I think I have it, but I keep it in a box and I forget that I have it sometimes. <laughs> right, right. And then I love the laser because these guys just go cuckoo over it. So it's it's fun, it's entertaining. And then you could just sit in the chair, you would just be reading your book. You know what I mean? And right. Hiding that laser <laughs> around there and, and letting the guys uh, go, go crazy. So it's a lot of fun. Yes, yes, those are good ideas. Um, I wanted just to go back to the diet for a minute. Um, we were talking about the cats and the protein, but what about fats? You know, um, I'm kind of a proponent of ancestral diets, and paleo has worked very well for hum some of my clients um, to heal the gut. So I was just wondering about the role of fats in their food. Yeah, normally you're going to get fat, um, you know, if you're on a, a prey diet. Um, and a little bit of fat is, is good. I mean, we need that for the tissues, um, and it is, you know, you'll get more calories out of fat than you do with protein or carbohydrates. So it is, it is there, there's a purpose for it, but um, high fat diets obviously can lead to obesity, but also pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing a lot of pancreatitis in cats, Hmm. Just, again, because the, these foods are not really appropriate for the species um, that are out there on the shelves, the commercial uh, pet foods. So we do see um, obesity and we do see some pancreatitis, and, and that can become uh, chronic. So so fat does serve a purpose, um, but we want low fat, it's, especially because now, you know, we also have taken these pets and cats and domesticated them and turned you know, a pet that's roaming around and hunting and playing and, and, and doing a lot of activities, we made them sedentary. Mm -hmm. So they do not need the, the cows, you know, and the calories that obviously a heavily working pet would need, okay? They're sitting and they go window to window to window. Um, so, so those pets we really want to, you know, look at their activity like you have. You have two different kind of personalities and one may need more fat than the other pet. Mm -hmm. um, and fat will definitely, especially in commercial foods, I mean, they, you know, it, it's going to be a part of that formula for sure. But I love fish oils. I love getting fish, giving cats fish um, that you get, you know, human, human grade. Um, sardines are awesome for cats. Salmon is awesome for cats. So, because you get the omega-3 fatty acids right. out of that. Right, right, exactly. They're essential, and mm -hmm. essential means that the pets have to eat them. They do not make these fats on their own, mm -hmm. okay? 
So that's where it's going to be in the foods because of that fat. But also what I like to do is give it in the more natural form. Mm -hmm. Even versus like a fish oil pill or a fish oil pump. Mm -hmm. I like to give, because cats love, they typically love, you know, tuna, sardine, salmon. Right, the, the fatty fish. Right, exactly. Now again, you don't do that every day. But you mm-hmm. can do that, you know, as a special treat on Sundays or twice a week or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the uh, issue with a lot of human diets, and I think it's the same in this commercial cat food, you know, this, the parallel would be with processed food, is that it's very high carb and it's low co- quality carb. So, again, in cat food, you're not looking for any uh, high carbs or even medium carbs. Right. You're, you don't want high carbs, definitely. So you want to try to avoid that uh, in, in, in all cases. The high carb foods are going to be lower protein, less quality, because it's cheaper. Mm-hmm. Okay? Protein is more expensive. Carbohydrates are not. So um, these pet foods will definitely have more. You're going to see, you know, potatoes in there or rice, like you noticed. Um, so they're going to have some plant material soy, stuff like that, to dilute the protein part. And with cats, definitely that's, that's huge. Again, they're obligate carnivores, so we, we want them to have a good quality, higher protein um, amount. So carbs, again, and we need carbs too, mm-hmm. they serve their purposes as well, but we don't want, especially in cat diets, we don't want them to be overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. So that should be, they should be on a a low carb diet. And like we were talking earlier, you know, you can get that probably from like, I think you mentioned sweet potato or pumpkin or something like that. Yeah, I love for a carb, but overall it's a good good quality carb for dogs and for cats. I love the pumpkin and the sweet potato. And actually, um, the cats will... Because they like sweets too. Okay, mm-hmm. a lot of cats do have a little sweet tooth. Um, they'll even eat cantaloupe and, and some things like that. But um, uh, they they usually love it. And, and what I've done, if uh, what's well, very convenient, is a lot of times if you get like an organic baby food that's just a sweet potato. Mm-hmm. There you go. It's pureed. It's human grade, and the cats will just lick it right up. So I'll use that for diarrhea. That's one of my go-tos. Um, if there's loose stool in dogs or cats, I definitely will put them either on sweet potato or pumpkin. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And then on a daily basis, um, what would you recommend? You don't need to give them, unless they are still ailing, okay, mm-hmm. unless they still have a ailing gut, you don't need to give it to them daily. You can give it to them a few times a week just mm-hmm. for fun. Right. Um, yeah. And then and that'll, that, it's great fiber. It's really, really good fiber now. Right. For me, the more fiber approaches that I've used would be the sweet potato and the pumpkin. Mm-hmm. If, you're, if you want to direct, you know, to the intestinal tract. Right, sure. And then, would you, is there a brand that you recommend on a daily basis? Uh, for, for what? For, for cat food or dog food or just, you know, a commer- like Yukonaba would be, is that one that I... Recall being high in protein, had a fairly good profile, so I was wondering if that... So, most of, um, if, if my pa- pets and patients are going to go commercial, um, then what I have them do is we, we tend to focus on no-grain foods, mm-hmm. okay, or very low-grain foods, because again, grains can be used just to dilute the product and make it cheaper, so we tend to do that, and... We, we go with foods that don't have a lot of, um, I call them subtitles, you know, where it'll say chicken meal or turkey meal right. or chicken meal byproduct. Right. So, you know, the more words after your meat source um, means that there's going to be usually lower quality. So we try to have the first five ingredients on the food, whether it's canned, whether it's um, in a in a bag, whether it's the kibble, then we want it to say chicken, and then your carbohydrate, and then it's going to be all just 
vitamins, some herbs in there, and things like that. So we don't want a lot of these words that'll say meat meal or byproduct. Mm-hmm. We like to just have it as pure as possible. Sometimes right. that's not a bad thing, those words, but um, the more words that you see in there, the quality of that protein is going to be um, lower. It's just going to keep dropping the quality of the product. Right, absolutely. And then I also saw, even on a more expensive vet prescribed cat food for digestive care, there was artificial flavors. Right. And I've decided, you know, I'm not going to give my cat that either. So. Right, right. So, so I mean, just, you know, even even like us, you're, you're, you know, you're going, well, artificial isn't real, so you're giving them a chemicalized product, you know, or a product that's that's been changed somehow. So we're seeing, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've had a lot of cases where, um, you know, they've been on commercial pet food for a long time and they're allergic, you know, they get these tests, these allergy tests, they're allergic to everything and chicken's on there, beef's on there and I'll put them on cooked chicken, mm-hmm. okay? So they're allergic to chicken according to the paper, right? Right. The lab tests and according to what they're eating, they have itchy allergies to a chicken-based commercial diet, mm-hmm. when I put them on real chicken, mm-hmm. it's a whole different ball game. Mm-hmm. It's a whole different ball game. And people are amazed. They're like, well, look at on paper, it says they're allergic. Yes, they're allergic to chicken, but that's not, you know, that's chicken that they're allergic to from the pet store or from the pet foods, right? Because right. it's nature that's changed. It doesn't look like real chicken. When you feed the body something that it's genetically made to recognize, Mm-hmm. You can actually handle that. So that's where if if the pet the commercial pet foods are failing and we're trying different things, even if it's, you know, a one protein, one carb, a hypoallergenic food, even if that's not working, I go with then let's cook it, let's do raw if that's appropriate. We can't handle that stuff that's produced in the factory. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No matter how good it is, no matter how expensive it is, sometimes that's the case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because um, one of my cats in particular really wants to eat my food, and being a, a nutritionist, you know, I do eat very well and very healthy. And I've had a little bit of an issue with her wanting to literally lick the pans and and help herself, like steal some of my salmon <laughs> off my plate. And, and there's nothing wrong with and, that. And now I realize, yeah, she's intuitively yeah. kn- knows that this is probably as good as it gets, you know? And, Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. And, and, and they miss that. You can't change DNA. I tell clients this, okay? We could domesticate these pets and all kinds of stuff. We could change the breeds, but we can't change this innate. So this is where I like to replace that. We're trying to fit them in our artificial world. It's not just food, it's environmental things as well. And of course they're, they're inflamed. Of course they have illnesses. Mm-hmm. Um, again, we, you know, the cats, we made them, they're, they used to be nocturnal. Mm-hmm. You know, we changed right. just their circadian rhythm. So we have to look at these, you know, let's go back to basics, everybody. Let's go back to what we are doing to these pets, putting them in these artificial environments. So with that, the food has changed. Their environments have changed. Um, the medicine is is introduced into their world. Mm-hmm. That's why I like to be more natural. I try to change things. So I try to make it to where they where they came from, to where their ancestry was, because mm-hmm. they carry that with them. Right. Right. No, that makes total sense, and I'm totally. This is what I do with my client, my human clients. Is you know look at. It's called, you know, evolutionary uh, ways of, of patterns and ways of eating, and the ancestral diet is part of that. They've went and studied all these cultures, traditional, in the true sense of the word, cultures, right. primitive cultures even. So it's just... That's why. Yeah, it's fascinating, and it makes complete sense to me. So it sounds like, on the whole, we're better off just cooking, sharing perhaps their own cooked chicken, 
you know, which I buy from the farmer's market, from the farmer, right. and um, or even beef, or is there some things we should not be giving to our pets? That you no, I mean, I tend to stay away from, like, the more gamier meats, mm -hmm. you know? So, so you know, the more common things that you have, and even pork, I, I tend to stay away from that a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. But the, the chicken and the beef and turkey, the poultry is pretty decent. Um, and then different kinds of um, the red meats are good. Fan, you know, the fishes are fantastic mm -hmm. just because of the great omega-3 fatty acids that you get from right. them. Right, right. Um, so... You know, not, not a lot of people are eating venison anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. So um, that's, that's usually not even available to the, to the pets. But exactly what you mentioned, just to improve, you know, let's say you, you, don't, you can't afford it or you don't want to bother changing their diet, you've you got a good rhythm going on and everything's okay, top dressing, just top dressing, maybe take away a little bit of what, how much you have served and throw in some real food. Mm -hmm. Throw in some real food. Or a few times a week, throw in some real food. Mm -hmm. Meaning cooked meat. You mm -hmm. can do these carbohydrates. That'll be good fiber. So not just carbs, but they're good for the fiber. And so, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a start. Absolutely. A something extra, something supplemental for them. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And I would think, too, I mean, I tell my clients this, but it really helps to either buy your food from a farmer, um, and so it's pastured, right? You're getting that omega-3 automatically, you know, in the beef and the red meat um, because right. he, they're grass-fed animals. Right, yes. And if you can, and again, you know, right. being more right. organic, um, you know, cage-free, grass-fed, things like that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that comes with a higher price tag. Mm -hmm. You know, I get it. I understand it because these foods are can be very costly. Farmers' markets are awesome. You can set mm -hmm. up a relationship with a lot of people, uh, you know, people from those places. Butchers. I right. tell my clients to go make friends with their butchers. Mm -hmm. And even if it's at the grocery stores that they tend to shop at, mm -hmm. you'd be surprised. They'll yeah. cut raw bones for you. You, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. They... They're, they're entertained by the dedication of a lot of pet owners, and, and they'll help you. Right. So definitely just, you know, talking talking to these people who, who make these um, products or, you know, who slaughter the animals, who raise the animals, and see what they have to say. See what their quality is like. That obviously is, is great because it's, it's trying to be as organic as you can. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what exactly what I do. I vet... Um, the farmers and, and also the uh, producers of the vegetables that I buy from, not, not that we're going to give those to our pets, but, but it, the whole point is just interviewing them, talking to them, making sure that their standards are similar to, you know, your philosophy. Yeah, exactly. Because for me, it's also important they treat their animals humanely. So I had a conversation right. with a Mennonite farmer here who comes down from Pennsylvania every week to our local farmer's market and I just try I buy every week from him so right yeah it's great it's good, it's good that you have that availability mm -hmm, exactly but there's also even on my website I have a few um, U.S. grass uh, U.S. meats and, and they have a lot of grass-fed products um, so people they can order online too good uh, so yeah so uh, just to um close up here. I wanted to ask you uh, how common or rare integrated veterinarians are in the United States? Um, become certified in acupuncture, you have to be a vet. Or chiropractic, you have to be a vet. Or herbs, you have to be a vet. So when you say holistic vet, then they're already, you know, they're a veterinarian, so they have the traditional tr uh, training. Which is good, because then they know diseases. Okay, right, so the, so exactly. So get misdiagnosed and they'll understand the, the language and what the medications that if that client comes to them, the patient comes with, um, you know, a bag full of medication. So where you want to look for, um, because again, other vets don't even know who's in their area and sometimes there's not too many per square foot uh, or square mile, I should say. 
is it's the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. Mm -hmm. What you do, it's the ahvma.org. Mm -hmm. You can go to their website and you can actually put in your zip code and you can find out where is the nearest um, holistic veterinary veterinarian in your area. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many members they have? I'm just curious. A lot. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. I, do, I can't tell you offhand, but that is where we all go. You know, that's, we all, it's almost like us belonging to the AMA, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a holistic vet, everybody um, belongs to, to that club, to mm -hmm. that association. Mm -hmm. um, and we have chat groups, so we reach out to our peers all the time. We also have, you know, it's international, so we have, there's members um, in other countries, and then this way we can get their perspective and their research, too, and things like that. So it's amazing. It's, it's, it's a very, very large association. Well, you just answered my next question, because I do have an international audience. So, I'm, yeah, so it sounds like that would cover the international folks as well. Yeah. Um, I'm also and, and, go and ahead. They probably have their own local, you know, it, it, whatever countries. They probably have their own um, association that their practitioners would belong to as well. I would imagine. Mm hmm Also, what about licensure? Should people? You mentioned you're in Arizona, so um, I would assume. Correct me if I'm wrong. That you're licensed to practice in Arizona as well as that you were licensed to practice originally in Illinois. Is that correct? Right, so if you're going to practice in a state, um, being a veterinarian, period, whether you're holistic or, or what whatnot, you would have to be licensed in that state. So I'm licensed in Arizona and in Illinois. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I can go, you know, physically see my patients in either of those states. I can also give advice to my patients in Illinois, even though I live in Arizona, and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. So I just have to ask, do you recommend that pet owners buy pet insurance? It, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm kind of on the fence. Uh, there's some good companies out there, and there, there are not so good companies um, on what they cover. And, you know, it's just like shopping for human. Uh, you know, you, you have your every month, you have to pay your premiums, and then, you know, do they pay 80 20 so there's, there's, some of them are very similar and kind of mimic human um, insurance policies. Um, but I have to say, overall, um, because especially I do a lot of rehab and then, of course, the holistic, is that I would, the advice would be, yes, if you are seeking it, because I think it does help, um, to ask them if they do cover alternative medicine and if they do cover rehabilitation because you'd be surprised if your pet broke a leg and had to have rehab. Um, you know, obviously these these modalities and these programs can come with some expense that's unexpected. So, it's, there's, again, there's good companies and there's bad companies and you really have to do research because they're popping up like crazy. Um, the one, uh, and, and some may just be regional. You just like regular uh, human, um, insurance companies, you know, they may only practice in certain states, so you have to look up, too, what is offered in your state. Um, we have Healthy Paws has been awesome, and True Panion, and those are the top two that um, I see here in Arizona, and every state probably has its favorites, too, depending on what, com um, what companies will practice in their state. Mm-hmm. I know when I thought about it recently for my cats, they, you know, they are older, they're 13, so I couldn't help but think, well, they're going to charge more for older pets. Mm -hmm. And they do. Mm -hmm. You know, again, they're all, they're all different. Some will, um, will not cover, uh, obviously, pre-existing conditions. Some of them won't cover congenital con conditions. So you want to, you know, especially if you're going to get like a German Shepherd, and we all know German Shepherds have problems with their legs, right? So. Uh, you got to look at your policy and say, hey, would you cover if, if my pet develops hip dysplasia? So there are some companies out there who will cover surgeries and things like that, but you really have to do your research, and it's going to be, again, like you, it's going to be dependent on, to the age of your pet at the time that, at the time that you're signing on to the policy. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Exactly. So read the fine print. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's great advice. So um, where can uh, patients, if they want to bring their pets to you, where can they find you? So you can go to my website. It's um, www.integrativeveterinarian.com. Um, I am in Northeast Scottsdale, um, and I'm with uh, an orthopedic surgeon. I'm in his office. I rent space. And we have a, a full workout room, and that's where I do my acupuncture, chiropractic, and my consultations. And then we have um, an underwater treadmill as well. Um, so we're, uh, we're, Northeast Scottsdale is, is, it's kind of central, okay, mm -hmm. so it's not, we, in Arizona, everything is based on the valleys, West Valley, North Valley, East Valley, so we're kind of the northeast part of, of the valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see, um, look me up, look up my bio, look up, I have fun videos on there of the dogs working out, um, I have some articles on there, some definitions and things, so some informative uh, material uh, to read, I have a blog, and my email's on there, so everybody can contact me if if, uh, if they have any questions, and, and we can go from there. Yeah, and I will list that uh, URL, the link to your website, in the show notes. And I was wondering, though, if you do any remote consultations? So, uh, that, that gets a little interesting um, because of different states uh, where you have your uh, veterinary license. And giving information over the email, okay, and from Arizona is not allowed. Mm -hmm. Because Arizona's policy is that in order to establish a veterinary patient relationship, you have to have a physical exam on your patient. Mm -hmm. So we can actually get in trouble um, for giving advice, um, you know, directly from email to email or phone uh, consultations and things like that. So that is definitely discouraged in our state. But there's probably other states that will allow um, that to happen because you're, you know, and then you're taking money, if you will, from the client. So it's actually a business transaction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, different states and their policies on how they monitor their veterinarians. Um, it's, I'm sure that's not nationwide. Um, so I cannot do a lot of uh, consultations um, unless they're in Arizona or in uh Illinois. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thanks for clarifying that. And then you also wanted to let our listeners know about your upcoming radio show? Yes, I'm very excited. Um, this will be uh, probably one, maybe maybe the only one in the country. So it's going to be a weekly radio show. It's on Arizona time, 4 to 5 p.m. on Fridays. Um, what's, what's great about it is it's an internet radio show, so it's syndicated in 140 countries, and um, so obviously I'm going to get a lot of phone calls from um, from a lot of uh, people who don't even live here, which is going to be awesome. And how their pet care is going, you know, how that their culture will be is going to be fun to learn some things about other people. But anyway, so what this is is it's going to be um, it's called Pet Panorama. And why I chose that is because we're not just going to talk about health issues. We're going to talk about the whole life of the pet. We're going to talk about pet travel. We're going to talk about pet food. We're going to talk about pet activities, uh, pet sports, medicine, uh, holistic things, rehabilitation things. So there's uh, behavior problems, um, you know, paranoia, uh, different kinds of psychotropic herbs and, and homeopathic remedies that we could do. So. So there's going to be a lot to talk about. Um, each month I'm going to have a, a theme. So there's going to be just an, a whole uh, umbrella theme. And then every week we're going to do segments under that theme. Um, people can call into the show and I can give them information once it airs. It's going to air February 17th. We're going to do a pilot series for 13 weeks and then we're going to go into full swing. Um, but it's voiceamerica.com. Um, it's awesome. I've been on their site, and I've, I've actually viewed other um, people's uh, shows, and the hosts are really awesome, and there's a lot of different topics. And this is the first pet animal program that they have, so I'm excited to be pioneering this project for them. Mm -hmm. um, 
So you can Twitter in, you can uh, Facebook if you're too shy to get on the phone and talk to me. Um, and I can get to people's questions, again, based on the topics and the things that we're going to have. So it's going to be fun. Uh, we're going to be really telling some good truth, um, which I, I'm excited to be able to share with, you know, with the listeners because I want a lot of people to know what other kind of options and, and the alternative healing modalities are. So I'm really excited to get the word out. That's exciting. Um, now, I think at the top of the program, we mentioned a holistic animal care radio show. Is that something else? No. So that's, it's, it's a definition of that. The name of the show is Pet Panorama. Okay. It's called a holistic, um, you know, holistic animal care radio show. Okay. Well, that is... But the name, so if, if they go to the website, they'll search for Pet Panorama. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. So that's exciting. I'm going to tune in because there's a, as a pet owner, I'm always learning. And I love that people can, uh, I assume, ask you questions and uh, as well. I like that part, too, because um, it makes it dynamic, this way, because I'm just listening to me talking for, you know, 50 minutes. Right. So um, I... Uh, to engage the audience is fantastic. And, and then people can go, hey, you know, that's what happened to me. Yeah, I got to listen to this. So I'm excited to get other um, folks' input on, you know, what what concerns that they may have based on what we're talking about. So it's it, being interactive, I think, is, is great. Oh, fantastic. And I think you're going to be answering a lot of people's questions. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. But that's, that's what I'm here for. That's what I'm here for. So I want to thank you so much, Dr. Julie, for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. And listeners, next episode, my regular co-host and certified nutrition specialist, Amy Berger, and I will be talking about the research on high-intensity training and how that may benefit you. So stay tuned for that. Be well, everyone, and have a great week.